went into cardiac arrest, I think uh, about Wednesday, and is still in the hospital in a very grave condition. So she'll be in our prayers as well as Norma Mueller. We have been praying for her. That's Bruce Mueller's mother. Bruce died about six weeks ago. Norma died this week. Our gospel text is about Jesus sending out the 70 to, uh, on a mission to spread the good news about the kingdom of God. And we'll talk about what that means for us. Let's prepare our hearts for worship through the brief order of confession and forgiveness found on the third page of your bulletin. Please rise. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, abounding in steadfast love toward us, healing the sick and raising the dead, showering us with every good gift. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Just and gracious God, we come to you for healing in life. Our sins hurt others and diminish us. We confess them to you. Our lives bear the scars of sin. We bring these also to you. Show us your mercy, O God. Bind up our wounds. Forgive us our sins and free us to love. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The Apostle Paul assures us, when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ, nailing the record of our sins to the cross. Jesus says to you, your sins are forgiven. Be at peace and tell everyone how much God has done for you. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Share God's peace by greeting those around you.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. O oh God, the Father of our Lord Jesus, you are the city that shelters us, the mother who comforts us. With your spirit accompany us on our life's journey, that we may spread your peace in all the world. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
A reading from Isaiah. Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad for her, all you who love her. Rejoice with her in joy, all who, you who mourn over her, that you may nurse and be satisfied from her consoling breast, that you may drink deeply with delight from her glorious bosom. For thus says the Lord, I will extend prosperity to her like a river, and the wealth of the nations like an overflowing stream. And you shall nurse and be carried on her arm, and dandied on her knees. As a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. You shall see, and your heart shall rejoice. Your bodies shall flourish like the grass. And it shall be known that the hand of the Lord is with his servants, and his indignation is against his enemies. The word of the Lord. especially for those of the family of faith. See what large letters I make when I am writing in my own hand? It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh that try to compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. Even the circumcised do not themselves obey the law, but they want you to be circumcised so that they may boast about your flesh. May I never boast of anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is anything, but a new creation is everything. As for those who will follow this rule, peace be upon them 
and mercy and upon the Israel of God. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 10th chapter. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest upon that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into its streets and say, Even the dust of our town that clings to our feet we wipe off and protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me, and whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. The seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, in your name even the demons submit to us. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. I'd like to invite the children to come up. Oh, it's such a happy weekend. Why? <laughs> I'm going to show you two symbols today. Have a seat. The first one, can, I, can somebody tell me what this is a symbol of? <laughs> hey! This is a flag of the United States of America. I think I gave one of these to you on uh, Memorial Day. Now you're going to get another one. This flag, you know the interesting thing about the United States of America? We do not belong to the United States of America. The United States of America belongs to us. So this is a symbol of our great country and it belongs to you. All right, here's another symbol. A greater symbol. Can anybody tell me what this is? Oh, come on now. <laughs> this is the cross. I know you all know what this is. This is a cross. And this is important for us. In fact, when you were baptized, the sign of the cross was put on your forehead. And 
it's a sign to show you who you belong to. It's sort of like a last name. Everybody know their last name? <laughs> I, I know these are tough questions this morning, evidently. For instance, my last name is Freeberg. My last name tells me who I belong to. The cross tells us who we belong to. That's why we mark the sign of the cross on our foreheads. We belong to God. Okay? Our country belongs to us. We belong to God. So I'm going to give you all one of these symbols. There you go, Melody. And now, let's pray. You're a tough crowd today, by the way. <laughs> Repeat after me. Gracious God, Gracious God. we thank you. We thank you for our nation. Most importantly, we are thankful that we belong to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. You can go back to your seats. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Happy Independence Day. I tried to um, find a way that we can have a theme that is related to our independence, at least related to our nation. I uh, could have talked about lamb, being sent out as lambs amongst the wolves or even something like uh, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers. But uh, at Pub Theology this week and at uh, Faith and Current Events, we looked at an article from Time Magazine that Janine Seward uh, sent to me. It was written by an author, Sebastian Younger. He said something about our soldiers coming back with post-traumatic stress disorder that he says this. The fact that there are so many compared to previous wars, there are so many. And he said since war happens to be a part of human life ever since the beginning. We wouldn't be able to survive as a species if there was going to be half the people who went to war coming back with PTSD. So he suggests this. The level of long-term trauma isn't a function of the trauma. It's the function of the society you come home to. In other words, the vets, the vets aren't messed up. We are. We as a society. Here's what we're not providing. The common sense of loneliness and the lack of communal utility that people sense like what am I here for? Who am I helping? Who needs me? Those things don't seem to be answered in our society anymore. So someone who's been through a tremendous tra trauma comes back and is not brought into a healing environment, but something that makes them sick or at least allows them to continue in their sickness. So is there an answer? I think we'll find an answer in today's text. Uh, 
Let's talk about the Apostles' Creed for a minute. Is there anything in the Apostles' Creed that makes you cringe a little bit? We're probably used to things in the Creed, the cringe factor, but remember when we first changed the Creed back to saying a holy Catholic Church? People would cringe. There's still some of you out there that cringe every time we say it. People who are visitors go when we say it. Oh, I told you, there's something about this church that's different Catholic. We don't want that. The other thing is communion of saints. The whole idea that we believe, which the, both of those terms are biblical. Uh, of course, um, Catholic simply means universal. It means we are in communion with all believers, past, present, and future. We are com in communion with them all, even those who have died, past, present, and future. It's a universal church. And there's strength in that. There's comfort in that. There's hope in that. There's power in that. The communion of saints and the Catholic Church, the universal, all Christians together. Let me give you a communion. Oh, I, it's interesting how many people cringe at that, and I spent a good hour talking with a couple. They had come to worship here one week, uh, all the way from Nixa, and they chose us and said, we want to become members of this congregation, but we have tr some trouble. And I go, okay. And they said, do you have time right now to talk? So right after worship, I spent an hour with them. They only had two questions. What's this business about the Catholic Church? And I talked until I was blue in the face. They still wouldn't accept that Catholic simply meant universal. So I told them it was hard enough to change to Catholic, to change back, we're just not going to do it. The other thing is, this business about saints. We don't believe in the saints, that's, that's Catholic stuff. And I go, well, the Apostle Paul believed in the saints. Every church he wrote a letter to, he wrote to the saints. I said, you're a saint. We're all saints. All believers in Christ are saints. Well, we're sinners too, as Martin Luther pointed out, but we're saints. We're God's redeemed people. There's power in the communion of saints. There's power in the church Catholic. Let me give you an example of that before we get to the 70. It's a, Roger Shelton is a pastor from um, Tennessee. He went to the to Korea, and he was in the town of Pusan, Korea. And when he was there, he was uh, there as a visiting missions and uh, giving sermons and teaching Bible lessons. And somebody said, we've got a man who wants to see you. So he uh, went and traveled to this man's house, and when they got there, the man had a disease that was causing paralysis, and his, his legs were already paralyzed, and they, they said it was moving up his body, and he wasn't going to be around. He wasn't going to live very much longer. So Pastor Shelton went in to talk to him, and and he said, uh, I've come to you. And he didn't know what else to say. He said, I've come to you to tell you about Jesus. 
And the man said to him, I know. And Pastor Shelton goes, how do you know? And he said, well, I'm a Buddhist. I, my family, I come from a family of Buddhists. And I have this Bible. Somebody gave me this Bible. And I've read it twice from cover to cover. And I said to Almighty God, I said, if you are God of the universe, send somebody to tell me about Jesus. So he said, I've been waiting for you. So Pastor Sheldon to told him about Jesus. And when he was done, the man said, oh, thank you. You almost waited too long. You almost waited too long. Well, that's a communion of saints. We're in communion with this cosmic power that united all believers, past, present, and future. Let's talk about the 70 that Jesus sent out. Jesus is at the time in his ministry, time of his life, where he is now, as we learned last week, traveling to Jerusalem. That means he's on his way to die. And there's so much that he hasn't been able to do so he now calls together 70 of his followers and says, I'm sending you out. I'm sending you out two by two. By the way, 70 is too many. By that I mean, if you tell me, oh, Pastor Dan, I have 70 friends. You don't know 70 people. You don't really know 70 people. Now, you might have 70 acquaintances or 150 people who have friended you on Facebook, but you, but you don't know them. You can only know two or three. Jesus had 12, but he always brought three with him. It was only those three that he could truly know. You and I can only truly know and be known by two or three people. And you need those two or three people who know you, who can see through you, who still love you, that's the only way you grow. So Jesus says, I'm sending you out in pairs. Two people. You see, God calls us together as a communion of saints. Very imperfect people to do mission and ministry. We are imperfect. In fact, I've said before, We are a people of faith, hope, and love. We always need to keep that in front of us. But the church is a community of people, God's people, God's imperfect people who will irritate you. This isn't might irritate you, will irritate you. And you will irritate them. But together we grow in grace. We grow as people. Someone will get to know you and still accept you. That's a healthy community. People who aren't perfect, but we're God's people, united by faith, hope, and love, 
who irritate one another. But God calls us to love one another. And then we can truly know one another. Let me give you an example of this. David Walter Lauer. This comes from Christian Century. Christian Century was asked readers to send in mistakes they made in their life. And Pastor Lauer sent this one in, telling about how he and his wife were asked, they were hired to be program directors for a camp. And when they got there, something that they didn't know how to do very well, by the way, and when they got there, they were told that they were going to be an intergenerational camp. That meant all the learning opportunities were going to take place with all age groups. Not an easy task. So they thought, well, our, our theme will be the parables of Jesus, and we'll pick a parable every day. And some people will... Uh, the younger children will have them do artwork, and the older children and adults will act out the parable, and then we'll discuss it. And he says... First day, we used the parable of the sower. We acted it out, the young ones drew, and we talked about the meaning of the parable. I don't think we shed any new light on anything, but we did get through the day. Day two, we used the great banquet story and had a mild discussion, during which most of the young people said that they were bored to the embarrassment of their parents. Third day was the story of the Good Samaritan. And to our chagrin, the boys wanted, <laughs> wanted to be the robbers that beat up the guy and left him in the ditch. They, nobody wanted to be the Samaritan. They wanted to be the, guy, the, the guys that beat up the guy and left him in the ditch. We didn't think we added much that day to anyone's biblical understanding. So by this time, most of the, uh, the adults, and they included, were having tremendous misgivings about this intergenerational stuff. So he said, day four, the class on the prodigal son. We started it with fear and trembling. Again, we acted out the story. We had many young volunteers to play the wild brother with adults playing the father and the elder brother. When we got to the discussion of the parable, we started with the end of the story and the brother's refusal to attend the feast. All the young people said they would go to a party. All the young people said they would go to the party for their lost brother. At this point, the parents started saying that the kids didn't know what they were talking about. Do they know what this young brother did to the family? How can you welcome that person back unconditionally? And Pastor Lauer says, the classroom became pretty loud, and he understood that the children probably all at one time or another said to a brother or sister, I hate you but they could never understand, never welcoming them back. Where the adults, he said afterwards, um, if we had any doubts about having all the ages together, now we were sure it was a mistake. We split the class into young and old, and went with the, I went with the adults and heard some sad testimonials including that of someone who hadn't spoken to a brother in 20 years after the reading of a will. We only talked a little about the naivety of the young, but I began to wonder if some of the adults wished they could be as naive. After class, the conversations among the adults went on. Clearly, our being all together with divergent understandings opened up the parable anew. So what I was sure was a mistake 
ended up leading us to fresh, a fresh encounter of an old story. Last day was the parable of the lost sheep. Everyone agreed, let's go after that sheep. And they said, at the farewell ceremony, the hugs were long. The friendship circle seemed tighter. The hopes even stronger that next year they could get together again. Well, our country calls out for the church to be authentic, for us to be filled with faith, faith hope, and love, that we be that environment that loves one another, even when we irritate and anger one another, that our hugs be long, our friendships deep, that heals. Jesus says, if only two of you, just think, if only two of you have an idea for ministry, he wants to send you out. Only two of you. Maybe you'd get a team together. But only two of you need the idea to do something. And then you do it to build God's kingdom. It only takes two at a time. Not 70, but two. So Jesus calls us today to be a, an authentic community. But he calls us to do mission. Our country, our world needs it. Amen.
Make us joyful in sharing the good news of Jesus and make the harvest plentiful. Lord, in your mercy. Holy wisdom, you gave wisdom to our founding fathers who gave us a constitution that guides us in liberty and freedom. Help us to inspire leaders throughout the world to sow the seeds of civility, peace, and goodwill. We mourn with Turkey after this week's suicide, gun, and bomb attack. We share in the dis dismay and horror after the tel Taliban bombers attacked an Afghan police convoy. We give you thanks for all who give to help the hungry, the homeless, the refugees, and for all who band together to help one another in times of trial. Send your peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heal over all, we bring before you those in need of your healing presence. Be with all in need, especially Meredith Adams, Ryan Backus, Larry Carlson, Terry Carlson, Pam Cole, Wayne Delargy, Lucy and Lyle Dolly, Sally Drake, Daniel Everett, Ron Fells, Jeff Hemphill, Ron Hover, David Jones, Alan Caymans, Ellen Lassant, Carol Lohmeyer, Paula Merkley, Chris Marquardt, Willis Melgren, Eddie Miner, Carolyn Nyes, Leon Parker, Benita Stamper, Karen Stiltner, Rod Thurman, Luann Trask, and Linnea Ugla. Are there any others? Your favor endures for a lifetime. We offer our prayers of praise and thanksgiving, especially for Bud and Jane Schwab's 60th wedding anniversary. And on this 4th of July weekend, we thank you for our nation and the freedom and liberty we enjoy. Receive into your eternal life those who have died. We remember especially the family and friends of Lynn Peterson and of Norma Mueller. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, you call us to bear one another's burdens. Strengthen us in our commitment to the good of this congregation, our neighborhood, and our wider community. Lord, in your mercy, we lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting your promise to hear us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Let us pray. God of mercy and grace. The Lord be he with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give him thanks to who the Lord, our God. It is truly our delight, our duty, and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Fulfilling the promise of the resurrection, you pour out the fire of your Spirit, uniting in one body people of every nation and tongue, and so with Mary Magdalene, Peter, and all the witnesses of, of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power, In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All is ready. Our Lord invites us. Please come. You may be seated.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. O God, as a mother comforts her child, so you comfort your people, carrying us in your arms and satisfying us with this food and drink, the body and blood of Christ. Send us now as your disciples, announcing peace and proclaiming that the reign of God has come near. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. I want you to notice one thing in your messenger under what's happening today. I don't know how many people read that, but it says, Bud and Jane are celebrating their 67th wedding anniversary. That is not true. It's number 60. I actually typed that, and I was thinking about my parents when I typed it, and they celebrated their 67th uh, shortly before they died. Rex is going to tell us something about the Cardinals. Good morning. Just a quick note. Uh, August the 12th will be the uh, Luther night at the ballpark. In the past, we participated in this. You just got a ticket to go. This year, for $15, you get a cap. You get a T-shirt that says, the, it'll have the Cardinal logo on there, but instead of saying Springfield, it'll say Lutheran. And then on the back of the T-shirts, we'll have all the Lutheran churches that are participating. So it, it's be kind of a special uh, time this year. So there's a sign-up seat in the back. So for $15, you get a seat in the shade, you get uh, fireworks, and you get to see the Cardinals play. So if you have any questions, give me a call. That's a bargain. Uh, so remember to stay after and go uh, into the fellowship hall, and uh, you can help Bud and Jane celebrate today. Receive this benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.
Guided by the gospel, we welcome all to worship, make disciples, hunger for ministry, nurture youth, gather resources for growing ministries, offer healing and care to all in need. Go in peace, remember the poor. Thank you.